you will notice very often that upon certain public occasions prayer is brought into the situation such as uh, opening of Congress so forth many other public occasions are made an occasion of prayer that is uh, for a moment of prayer and you will notice that the form of prayer is usually a turning to God to ask for something to invoke the divine blessing divine grace now notice that every time we begin any work that we also make it an occasion for prayer but the prayer is not accomplished with words or thoughts no words and no thoughts enter into our prayers our prayer is a uniting of ourselves with God what good would words do what good would thoughts do if we were in violation of that which is necessary to establish contact or union with God now one thing is necessary to establish contact, union, oneness, at one with God, and that is a complete absence of uh, desire, even desire for good. In other words, we are taking no thought for any form of good. If there is a desire, it is only the desire for this union, for this experience this contact in other words we do not pray for electricity we plug in uh, at the uh, point of the contact here too prayer with us having taken the first steps of prayer the clarification of consciousness we now come to the higher sense of prayer in which we have recognized that taking thought will not add one statue one cubit to our stature taking thought will accomplish nothing for us and so we are through now with words and thoughts and we have entered this place of communion of conscious union with god actual contact or the experience experience of God I shall see thee face to face yet in my flesh I shall see thee face to face when when we're still when we're quiet when we have withdrawn the labels of good and evil when we have acknowledged God in all our ways when we have obeyed the first commandment acknowledging God as the central theme of our being acknowledging God as our good not some form of God acknowledging God as our good acknowledging God as the principle of our being acknowledging God as the all and as the only and loosing him and letting him go loosing all these evil concepts erroneous concepts let them go acknowledge the presence and perfection of God the is and then stand in that consciousness that exalted consciousness of oneness and let the light shine within thee upon thee through thee to the without let this contact be established now prayer is an activity of the soul now prayer is an act of grace it's not an act of man it's an act of god 
Prayer is an act of God taking place within me. It is a union with God, is a contact with a source of infinite good. And it is done without words and without thought. It is done by standing still in being, with no judgment, no criticism, no condemnation, no praise, no flattery, not even a praise of God, an acknowledgment of God. The acknowledgment of is. It is. I am. All that God is, I am. All that the Father hath is mine. I and the Father are one. Thou seest me. Thou seest the Father shining right through me. For I and the Father are one, even though the Father is greater than I. The invisible is greater than the visible, because the invisible is the source of the visible. I and my Father are one. I in him and he in me. Ah, but it's also I in you, and you in me, and we all one in Christ Jesus, that is, in spiritual being, in spiritual sonship and identity. Oh, it is so simple. I wish you could know how simple it is to sit here and realize within that I am in you, and you are in me, and we are one in divine sonship. But oh, soon we leave this room, and we leave the presence of each other. We leave the presence of those whom we know are dedicated to the one true God. And now we have to face what is called the world, the world of men. Here it becomes just as necessary to close the eyes to the appearance, loose the appearance and let them go, and again declare, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Never, never, never leave your home in the daytime. Never leave your homes at night without this conscious realization. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. You see, I am and is is the same thing. I am in the Father, the Father is in me. We are one. Ah, uh, but I am in thee. And this statement is now going broadcast to the world. I am in thee, and thou art in me, and we are one in him. We are a spiritual brotherhood. We are one in Christ Jesus. Who is this we? The spiritual identity of every soul. Man, woman, child, plant, animal, vegetable, mineral. We are one in our spiritual identity. There is nothing in this world antagonistic to me, and I am antagonistic to nothing in this world because spiritually I and the Father are one, and that oneness constitutes my oneness with all spiritual being. I am in thee, and thou art in me, and we all are one in him. Repeating these words avails nothing, but in this silence, in our early morning before leaving home, in our evening before leaving home, we establish consciously, or we bring consciously to light, the relationship already existing between I and the Father, <coughs> and between I, me, and you, you and me, and we in 
him. There's no room then uh, for anything harmful or destructive going from us to another or from another to us. And even the weapons that are formed against us have no power. Even the weapons of human belief, human concept, human thought, even the weapons of mortal belief have no power against the individual who has consciously realized his oneness with God and his oneness with each other on every level of life. Man, woman, child, animal, vegetable, mineral, we all are of the one soul. And that soul is in me and it is in you, and that soul is voicing itself. Now, for purposes of teaching, I may voice this to you, as I have been doing. For purposes of prayer, it is unnecessary. There need be no words and no thoughts. There must only be the inner feel of that union. It is just like in our relationships with each other. We seldom have to say, I love you or I like you. We have far, far better ways of announcing that. And that is through our action, sometimes just through a glance of the eye. And so it is with God. We need not speak to God. And God need not speak to us. The language of the soul is spirit. Joan of Arc is asked, does God speak to you in French? And Joan answers, I don't know. I hear him in French. And so with us, God speaks the universal language of spirit, and you may hear God actually as a voice in your ear. Or you may see God actually as light or as a form. But if not, you will feel God just as a release or as a warmth or as a lifting in consciousness. There will be a sign, there will be a signal, but no sign shall be given them in advance. These signs shall follow them that have this conscious awareness. You cannot feel the presence of God until you have actually made the contact with God. Therefore, your prayer in its highest sense is the prayer of contact, of communion in which no words or thoughts pass from you to God, and there may not even be words or thoughts pass from God to you, but there will be an awareness. There will be an inner sense of communion, an inner sense of peace. True prayer comes to its completeness and its perfection when there are no desires in the mind. True prayer, which is communion, comes to full bloom when one has lost all sense of wanting something in uh, this feeling of communion, of resting in the soul. It is just as if all our wishes had been granted. It is just as if it were Christmas morning at the tree and we received all of our gifts and now just have the feeling of thank you everyone. And in the moment that our consciousness is lifted to that sense of thank you Father, thank you everyone, then comes the fullness and completeness of communion with God, and in that there is a resting in the soul. There is just a resting as a little babe rests 
in its mother's arms, so does that resting come to us in the soul. But the babe, you see, has no desire. The babe has no want, no needs. It is at rest. So do we come to a period of refreshment and of rest in proportion as we no longer take thought for what we shall eat or drink or wherewithal we shall be clothed in the realization that the Father knoweth that I have need of these things, and it is the Father's good pleasure to give me the kingdom. Then with that I rest, never seeking not even mentally desiring, but rather sitting back in pure rest. Then we come to a state of consciousness which in the infinite way I have called the beholder. It is as if we were sitting here at peace watching the activity of the day take place. We may be up early in the morning and watch the sunrise. We may go out into the garden and watch the flowers come into bloom. We may go to the postman and watch the mail being delivered to us. We may sit down at our desk and watch our mail being answered. We may have a call for help for prayer, and we sit down in this communion and watch God pray the patient well, watch God's communion dissolve the appearance and restore the harmony. At every period of the day we are the beholder. We do not strive for supply, we behold supply as it unfolds to us from infinite sources. We never pray for supply. We never pray for help. We become still, we rest in the soul. We let this prayer of the soul take place while we nestle in its warmth and watch as help appears. Opportunity. Always we must remember that we are not seeking to have our nets filled. Don't be concerned about those empty nets. We don't want filled nets. We have passed beyond that into the realm where all we want is to behold God's spiritual universe, tabernacle with God's sons and daughters. Enjoy the multiplication of loaves and fishes, multiplication done not by you or me or Jesus Christ, multiplication performed by the Father within me as we behold it. We stand at the tomb of Lazarus and we say, Father, I don't have to pray. I know that thou knowest. Oh yes. A lot of people standing around here who are waiting for a miracle and they expect me to do something. So, Father, I I'm going to pray, Lazarus, come forth. But that isn't really necessary. The Father knoweth my need. And I stand here as a beholder and wait for Lazarus to come forth. There's no use my praying for opportunity tomorrow. The Father knoweth my need. I will sit quietly in this atmosphere of soul and watch my opportunity come to me. The poem of Burroughs is wonderful in this connection. As the rivers flow to the sea, so my own shall come to me. I need not worry, no fret, and I have no doubt for that reason, that as the rivers flow to the sea, the rivers flow to the sea by some law of God, by some principle of good. It is a normal, natural thing for rivers to do. 
to flow to the sea, to feed the infinite oceans of our earth. And it is a normal and natural thing that God's grace flow to us. We have dammed it up by desire, by fears, by doubts. We have even dammed it up by going to church and praying for it. Yes, we have dammed it up by accepting the belief that God was something separate and apart from our being and was not aware. We were aware, but the omniscient and all-wise God was not aware of our need. Now we reverse all that, and when we say omniscient, when we say the all-wise God, the all-good Father, we accept that at its base value, and our prayer is a peace be still, a silent communion. Even that storm at sea, the Master never prayed that it be dispelled. His only prayer was peace, be still. Was he addressing water? He was addressing his consciousness, the consciousness of the disciples, the consciousness of the crew. Peace, be still. If your consciousness is still, there are no stormy waters within them. If your consciousness is still, everything about you takes on the complexion of that stillness. Just as this whole room is permeated with quiet, peace, joy, and love, how did it get here? Did somebody put it into the room? No. Because we are in a state of peace, because we have risen above desire, we have risen above hate, fear, enmity, we have risen above the belief that there is a presence or power about us that could be destructive to us. And so our consciousness has settled down into a peace. Be still. And uh, the very air partakes of that stillness. And if there were stormy waters here, they would be stilled. Our need is only for one thing. Conscious communion with God. That is the highest form of prayer. And that form of prayer can only take place after we have learned, first of all, that God is, and secondly, that all that exists in this universe is God ising. All that exists in this universe is God is. All that exists in this universe is is, is, spiritual is. It's neither human good nor human ill. It is neither human health nor human sickness. It is just spiritual is. Now, in that realization, when we turn to the higher form of prayer, which is communion, we have no need of words, no need of thoughts. We sit in perfect stillness until we feel that click, we feel that contact, we feel that overpowering sense of joy, of warmth, of gratitude, of love. And in that love we take in the entire universe. In that love we take in friend and foe, without words, without clearing it, without saying it, by being love, feeling love feeling a love that passes understanding because it isn't a love of person, it isn't a love of anything, it is just love. The love that has an object isn't love. When we say, I love you or I love it, him or her, that isn't really love. That is our limited sense of love, and that kind of love comes only in degrees, because we love him more and we love her less, and we love it still less. 
But when we say, I love, when we feel a sense of love pour out from us, it isn't to any him or her, but it includes all the hymns and all the hers within reach of our consciousness. It is an all-embracing love when it has no specific object. That is why you cannot say that you love God. You cannot say that you love God unless you love man. Whoever says that he loves God whom he has not seen, but does not love man whom he has seen, is a liar. Why? Because God and man is one. God is uh, manifested as man. Man really is that place where God shines through. Man really is the allness of God made visible to us. There is no way to love God unless we love that which God is. And so, our love is just love, and it is not a statement. Sometimes, oh, more often than not, there isn't much love if we make the statement. The love that is felt in a complete stillness, in a complete silence, is an all-embracing love. And we never aim it at friend or foe. We never aim it or include white and black or Jew and Gentile. No, no, no. That's not the real love. You can't imagine God saying, I love uh, you and you. With God, it is just love. With us, it is just love in communion, a feeling of love, an all-embracing love, an all-inclusive love that leaves nothing outside of its boundaries. I in the Father, the Father in me, I in you, and you in me. And that becomes a feeling not a statement. When uh, sufficient time has elapsed that you have worked with is and have come to a point where you no longer put labels, no longer believe in uh, things to be denied, no longer have even a mental defense against them, but like David, walk out without armor in the name of God and the nature of God. When that time comes, your prayers and your treatments, if we may use the word treatment, the help that you give to others will be performed without words and without thoughts. There is no need at all for a word or a thought in giving treatment after one has learned to lose him and let him go, after one has learned not to hold person, thing, condition in judgment or condemnation, in quietness, in stillness, shall be your strength, in quietness, in stillness, shall be your strength. Not in speech. Speech is silver. Silence is gold. Speech is our human way of interpreting the divine ideas. But the divine ideas express themselves, manifest themselves, reflect themselves within us without words. Now we can say to each other, I love you, and we can say it better without words. If we use words, we may be misunderstood because someone may misinterpret 
our meaning of the word love. But if we look what we feel, if it goes as a glance from the eye, or a touch of the finger, or the bestowing of a gift, there's no misunderstanding because the nature of the love is understood in the symbol. We hear this come right through the air. God is a very present help in trouble. Would making that statement make it so? Or is that statement telling us something that is already so? And so you see, our prayer wouldn't have to be a statement that God is a very present help in trouble. We could put the finger on the lips, be still, and receive an assurance within us that God is on the field, that the battle is not yours, but God's. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am in the midst of them. That is the fulfillment of I in him and he in me and I in you and you in me, all one. Showing too that there is no end of individuality. Never where two or more are gathered in this name. God individualizing itself, showing forth its qualities, character, nature as individual being. Amen, and let us rest for a while in this peace. A spiritual teacher is to lift the consciousness of the student to the apprehension, to the discernment of spiritual reality, that the student themselves may receive impartations of God within their own being, which they never could do on the human level of life. The function of the practitioner, likewise, is to lift the consciousness of the patient high enough above the storms of human sense to where they too may feel the divine harmonies flooding their being and body. But in our way of living, it becomes the function, the duty, the responsibility, the privilege of every individual to lift the world in some measure above its present low level of consciousness. In other words, I, if I be lifted up, shall draw all men unto me. Now, this is not a task. This is not labor. 
There is no effort to it at all because you don't have to reach out there to 90 people and lift them up. All you have to do is retire into your own sanctuary, into your own inner being, and find this peace. And the moment that you have found this peace, your household and all those who are attuned to you take on a measure of it in proportion to their receptivity. Certain it is that some may hold themselves outside of it, that, that you may know that I am in him and that he is in me, it is given to you to experience this peace and this calm. But it is likewise that you might know that your being in him and his being in you is the same peace be still to those who are of your household, of your consciousness. Now, just as there may be a thousand men outside this door, or women, who do not feel one single bit of the divine calm that has descended upon us, and you know it isn't because the calm and peace isn't here, it is because they hold themselves outside its influence so they could be right here in this room, many of them, and not feel it. Because their sense, their soul sense, would not be receptive to the voice of God. And so you may have those in your family circle, in your friendship circle, or business circle, who will, despite all of the lifting up that you do, may for a while at least, hold themselves outside of its influence. But the time will come when every knee will bend. The time will come when every man will be taught of God. It is not up to you to be concerned who responds to your elevated consciousness. It is not my concern whether those here respond to it or some withhold themselves from it. My function is to be so lifted in consciousness that all those who are here may partake of the bread, the spiritual bread, the wine, and the water. Not that it may be forced upon anyone, but that everyone with open consciousness may receive it. Now there are those in your household who are receptive and responsive to truth, and to them you owe the same obligation that I owe to you. I owe to you the obligation never to come into your presence except in the highest degree of consciousness possible to me at the moment. I owe that to you. I owe it to myself. I owe it to the Father who has lifted me above the storms of uh, the human world. That, however, is my obligation, my duty to the Father, and because of the Father it must also be to the Son, because if I do not love you, whom I see, I am not loving God, whom I cannot see. That is my function. You have the same function. When you were ignorant of this truth, it was not demanded of you. To him that hath shall be given, him that hath much shall be expected, much shall be demanded. So. In bringing yourself to this enlightenment, you now take upon your shoulders the responsibility of its being. You can never be released. 
the grace of God brought you here to receive this light of wisdom of the nature of God and of the nature of prayer. And the God whose grace gave you this light expects that you shall shed this light. It will not be necessary to proselyte. It will not be necessary to go seeking people. It will only be necessary to maintain your spiritual level within you. Even if no one in your world knows what you are doing, you owe no obligation to any man to tell him that you are praying for him or that you are benefiting him or that you hope to lift them above their troubles. You do not owe that to any man. But those who ask of you, you can assure and reassure. But whether you are ever asked for this light or not, you owe an obligation to the Father that revealed this light to you to let this light shine through you. And all you have to do you have no words to learn. You have no books to read. You have no statements to learn. You already know the secret. The Father is in me, and I am in him, and we are in each other. You know that secret. Now all you have to do is without any words and without any thoughts, twice a day, three times a day, four times a day, and uh, by next year, 20 times a day. Retire even if for a half a minute and acknowledge this presence, acknowledge this light, feel the divine energy, feel the spark. Live so that all men coming within range of your consciousness feel the outpouring of God upon them. You're the instrument. You are God's servant. Never forget that even if you say to yourself, I am the Christ of God, it doesn't make you great, it makes you lowly. Remember that the Christ of God, the Son of God, is a servant, not a master. Always remember that. All that the Son of God can be is a servant to his fellow men. He is forever at the service of those who call. Earthly kings, no. Earthly kings are served. Spiritual kings are servants. No one may ever boast or brag of divine sonship. Divine Sonship bestows with it a humility, a humility that knows that only the light of God can lift this room. Only the presence of God itself could lift the consciousness of those here to that place where they can witness the Father face to face. Right now, the resurrected Christ the resurrected Jesus may be visible to those who have eyes to see, ears to hear. Why? Because the raised consciousness is able always to perceive that which is invisible. See the invisible, hear the inaudible, know the unknowable. Only the grace of God could do that. Not the will of man, only the grace of God. The will of man only is that he may retire within and receive the divine impulsion, receive the divine grace that it may flow right from the fingertips, right from the eyes, right from the hairs on the head. Embrace this universe within your being. But let your being be still and silent.
so that the peace that passeth understanding may envelop and permeate the universe that you have taken within you. Remember, if your thoughts are chaotic, anything and anyone brought into your thought will feel that chaos. Be at peace. Be still. God is. God is light. God is the light of the world. Let that light fill your consciousness and then take the world into your consciousness. Let the world feel your peace the peace that passeth understanding, and then you will understand the Master. My peace I give unto you. Not a man's peace. My peace, the grace of the Father, flows through me to you. My peace. Not as the world giveth. No, no. Not a physical sense of good not a personal sense of safety or security. My peace. The peace now that no longer seeks safety or security or protection. No. The peace descends upon him who gives up the desire for safety security, and protection. The desire for these three is the acknowledgement of a force, a presence, a power opposed to God. Little David could not fit the armor to his body. It wouldn't fit. It couldn't. It couldn't. David recognized no power as able to penetrate God's will, God's love. then you will return now to the great wisdom and understand what this means. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Whithersoever thou goest, I will go. Yea, though I make my bed in hell, thou art there. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art there. Will you please carry this with you, that God has not forsaken you, whether you are in sin, or poverty, or disease, even unto death? Do you know that what separates us from our good, that very often causes us to pass on, is a conviction that because we are in the midst of some discord, that it is because God has forsaken us, that this wouldn't have happened if God had been with us? That is destruction itself to us. Remember this. Even though you make your bed in hell, God is there. Even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God is there. Don't ask why God has forsaken you. Don't accept any belief that God has left you <clears throat> and that this discord is an evidence of God's having left you. God can never forsake itself, and God is yourself. 